Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath again. We thank God for this privilege to have our visitors here in our meetings today. They have spared their time to be with us. In a special way, we would like to invite the visitors who are in front of us here this evening. We have the Women Ministries Director at the division, Debbie Maloba, who is in our midst. We want to thank you, Debbie, for coming. Our leaders, these are our leaders of the division, and we are very grateful to have you in our midst. Debbie is a very dedicated worker and very passionate about the women ministries, and we appreciate your ministry, Debbie. So we, she is here in our midst. Praise the Lord. Mungu ni mema. Jobo. Tuleta. God bless you. Thank you very much, Debbie. She is a very wonderful lady. And uh, the next I would like to introduce is our friend and working at the division. And this is none else but Emmanuel Belote. Manuel Belote, maybe you can come and greet the congregation. He is the assistant to the president of East Central Africa Division, Pastor Dr. Pledisius Ruguri. So please, just say hi. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm here today representing the chancellor of this university. And I know that if he were here today, uh, he would be so pleased to greet you and see all of your warm and friendly faces. I know that he supports you and he believes in the vision and the dream that God has given you in your hearts to succeed, to accomplish great things, to change this nation, to change East Africa, and even to change the world. So, uh, is it all right with you if I bring back to him warm greetings from you? Is that all right? Yes. That's all right. So, um, it is uh, an honor to be here this weekend because uh, we're here celebrating the achievements of thousands of women who have answered the call to become leaders in their communities. And they are preparing their, themselves, they're training themselves, they're being trained in leadership and how they can be transformational uh, agents in their families, in their communities, in their nations. And so it is definitely an honor of mine to be here with so many powerful and intelligent, compassionate women. And so we would want to celebrate these women and their calling that comes directly from God. Um, so I hope you'll join me if you see them walking around. And tomorrow, I hope you'll join me in celebrating them and congratulating them on making the choice to follow God over anything else in this world. Tonight, I'm also honored to be able to introduce uh, to you uh, probably... Um, I, no, I think it's pretty safe. My, the, the, favorite, my, the favorite man that I know. And uh, my apologies to Chancellor Raguri, um, but he's, you know, uh, there's one more. But before I do, let me just simply say this. Uh, you know, it's nice to be here with all these women who are doing these great things. And, you know, when you're around a lot of very motivated and, and um, hardworking uh, women, you know, you have to pay attention. Young men, you have to pay attention when you're around these women. Uh, they're, they're, uh, they're very strong. They're very intelligent. They can do a lot of things. So we have to have a lot of respect when they are around. Uh, but, you know, it's not easy uh, to care for and take care of a woman. And, you know, women, you know, us, the men are not always so easy to deal with either. Am I right? All right. You don't want to say, everybody's shy tonight? You don't want to say, okay. I, n I know. <laughs> but uh, one of the reasons why this particular man is, is uh, by, and, and I say this is my favorite man, 
Ladies, I didn't say he's my favorite male. There's a difference between being a male and being a man. All right? Did anybody, I got one amen. Oh, this, this sister knows what I'm talking about. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? There's a difference between being a male and being a man. And I would like to introduce you tonight to the favorite man that I know. See, because it takes something other than genes, genetic uh, information to make a man. So the man I want to introduce you to, you to tonight was a man that uh, began with very humble beginnings. This man, his family had really nothing. He's a member, uh, there were nine children in this family. And this man's father died when he was very young. This man worked to support his family. Some of you know exactly what that's like. Many of you are doing the same thing right now. This man, like all of you, had hopes and dreams for his future. And he was not afraid to work hard to achieve those hopes and dreams. But rather than being self-centered or selfish, this man gave up his opportunity to continue doing what you're doing now, where he could have just educated himself and gone on to take care of his future. But he thought of his family first. And he went back to work to make sure that they could succeed. And those younger brothers and sisters of his are very successful in America today, in no small part because of the sacrifices of this man that you are about to hear from tonight. This man had nothing, he was given nothing, he began with nothing, and yet he worked. And he became a leader in America. This man became an administrator, an employer of hundreds of people who looked to him for leadership. And from there, he went on to become a leader in the global Seventh-day Adventist Church, where the leaders of this denomination around the world would regularly come to him for counsel and advice and his wisdom that God had given him. This is a person, if as a young person, I would recommend to you that you listen very carefully to this man. I know that there are probably some ladies in the audience that one day they have in their hearts not only to be well-educated and be successful, but they hope one day to experience what it is to be truly and deeply loved by a man. You know, there's the kind of love that you see and read about and hear about on the radio, and then there's the kind of love that God talks about, the kind of love that God dreams about for you, the kind of love that one day you will dream about for your very own daughters. Ladies, let me tell you about this man who married a very special, very intelligent, strong, capable woman and was married to her and was faithful to her for 57 years. That in itself is, is good enough, but let me tell you, that woman that he married, this capable, strong woman who could do anything she set her mind to, very strong woman. About seven years ago, this woman became ill. She became very sick. She could not take care of herself. And this man who was traveling the world and receiving leaders from around the world and giving counsel and advice and making important decisions, this man that you're about to hear from tonight gave up all of that because he was committed to loving this woman. And he stayed home with this woman every day for seven years. T 
took care of her, made sure that she had food, made sure that she was dressed. And if you ever had the chance to talk to him, he would, he would tell you, doesn't she look beautiful today? That's my baby. For seven years he did this and he never, never, let me tell you ladies, this man never complained. In fact, you would think this was the moment he had been waiting for his entire life just to care for this woman that he loved dearly. But let me tell you, ladies, that is love. Gentlemen, take note, that is your example. That is love. But I wanna tell you about an even greater love, something that's very important that you hear about this man that you're going to hear from tonight. Because you see, I'm gonna tell you about this love of his and you're going to see it here tonight because one week ago, just eight days ago, last Thursday, this man lost the love of his life. Last Thursday morning, my mother passed away. But you know something? This man is here tonight because he loves someone even more than he loved my mother. This man loves Jesus Christ. And he is here tonight to share with you some of the gifts, some of the things that his Lord and his Savior shared with him that gave him the strength to care for his siblings, that gave him the strength to stay faithful and committed to his wife, that gave him the strength to care for her when she could not care for herself, that gives him the strength today to still listen to the call of his Savior and continue to carry on with the mission that God gives him in his life. So this evening, I, uh, it is my honor to introduce to you my father, George Pallot. Thank you. Dr. Reeves and distinguished platform guests and ladies and gentlemen, that introduction was somewhat, uh, you know, I was looking for that person myself on, on, on this platform, but uh, I guess it was my time to come up. But at any rate, sometimes when you have a son like Emmanuel, he kind of stretches things just a little bit that makes me a little uncomfortable, if you understand what I'm saying. But I'm truly happy to be here tonight I could go on for hours when I see an exciting young audience like I see here. One of the things that I did back, and this is not a part of my text here, and I'm going to get you out here on time, but when I see a vibrant audience like you, I get excited. Back in Maryland, I belong to a unit that teaches young people like you to fly airplanes. And every one of you could do the same thing if you put your minds to it. I could probably teach every one of you to take off in about 15 or 20 minutes. But it's a little bit more complicated to land. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Tonight, for a few minutes, what I would like to do, it was, I would like to disturb, if I may, your pure minds. I want you to critically think about why you are here. It cost you a couple of dollars to be here, I'm sure. Right? You, you come here for a reason. How many of you come here, or the ones of you who are students, how many come here because if I'm a student here and I graduate, I'll make more money? Let me see the hands of those people. Hmm. So you're here for another reason, right? I hope that reason is to better yourself. Number one, better yourself 
And then what is your secondary goal after bettering yourself is to help mankind. To start off with, one of the issues that I want to, you to think about is that you were made in the image of God. What does an image look like? That means whatever you look like would probably simulate or look something like, act like God. Is that right? Is that right? How many of you have that as a goal? Where's the goals tonight? Where's the goals? How many of you realize that you were made in the image of God? Everybody remember that? You made in the image of God. Okay. Define God. God, if you were going to define God with one word, what would be that word? Love. God is love. Our text tonight was taken from Genesis 1.1. And in Genesis 1.1, it states, in the beginning, God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. Now, where am I going with this? If you are, if you are an image of God, what have you created today? Did you get an A on your test today, or did you advance whatever you were doing in excellent fashion because you're in the image of God, is what I'm looking at? That's the first point. God is a builder. He was a builder. Are you building? What's the opposite of a building? Destroying. Are you building? What are you building? What is your goals in life? Are you making whatever you're engaged in better than it was before you were engaged? These are very critical thinking points that I want you to think about. In Genesis 1-1, it also talks about in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was what? Was without form and void. And what darkness was upon the face of the deep. Everything around was dark. But now, if you are made in the image of God, you're going to change that. So every time you either go to your job or you're in your classroom, you're going to do what? You're going to employ light light on that examination, light on your activities in your classroom. Everything's gonna be better because you remember that you are made in the image of God. There's no room for slackness if you're made in the image of God, okay? One other thing that uh, in Genesis 1-1 it talked about, and God went before he made anything, he identified it was dark. He evaluated. It's important that you take stock or inventory of your own life. Where are you? 
Where are you tonight? Where are you in your grades? Where are you in your assignments, in your work, in your office? Because you're made in the image of God, excellence is a part of what you're all about. Is that right? Excellence? Okay. So after you identify the needs, then the next thing that you will do is you will figure out with the Holy Spirit's accompaniment what the solution you will work that through with the power of the Holy Spirit, a solution for the deficits that you've identified when you evaluate. This is critical thinking that we're talking about here now, tonight. Now, one of the things that I just want to get to before we get ready to close here is the fact that, the fact that each of you should have by now, and I know I've talked to a lot of students, I've talked to a lot of my cadets when I was back in Maryland, and the first thing I would ask them is, what do you want to do when you finish school? And about half of them will say, I don't know yet. God has a special place for each of you. It's your responsibility to do what? To find out what is God's plan for your life. So goal setting and goal planning are very, very, very important. Now what I'm gonna tell you in the next three or four minutes is really something that I really think you already know, some of you probably already know it, but in goal setting, there is a process. Whatever you do in life, there is a process. How many of you like algebra? There's a process with algebra, right? Right, you have to have the process in order to get the right conclusion. There's a process. So if you're going to goal set, you have to set what we call SMART goals. What's the SMART goal? Number one, it has to be specific. Specific. If I wanted to land a plane at Nairobi, there are certain things that I have to tell the computer in my aircraft to get it to Nairobi. I gotta be specific. Because if I don't be specific, I might land in Tokyo. That wouldn't be quite where I wanna be. So we wanna be specific. The next thing that we want to do is we wanna make sure that there's a quantifiable finite to that to your specificity. If it's, if, for a good example, if I just said I wanted to lose some weight and I was 200 pounds, and I said, well, I'm, 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 on a, I'm gonna lose some weight. And someone said, well, how much weight do you wanna lose? Oh, well, I just wanna lose a little bit. What's a little bit? The goal should be, I would like to lose 10 pounds, specific, okay? After we're specific about what we want to do and it's measurable, we want to make sure that it's attainable. I can actually do this. After all of my assessments, I can actually do this thing. We're talking about a smart goal now. It's attainable. And the other part of it, is it realistic? Is it realistic? Is it realistic? Okay, good. So why, once, you, once you've decided that it's realistic, that it's specific, it's measurable, okay, it's attainable, and it's realistic, and the last thing on that smart scale that you already know about is what kind of time framing. 
Because if I said I wanted to lose 10 pounds, but I want to do it uh, in 10 years, is that realistic? Hmm. It doesn't matter, 10 years. But it's got to be within a measurable period of time that will be meaningful to me in the, because I'm in the image of God. Whatever the goal is, the goal has to enhance my image of God, okay? One of the things that we really, the reason we, we set goals is because we want to be what? We want to be, we want to be good, right? How many of us want to be good? Anybody want to be good? What's the opposite of being good? Let's ask, let's ask that question. What's the opposite of being good? Being bad, right? So what is good? What is good? What does the Bible say good is? Over in Michael, it talks about what it is to be good. It, it says, I have shown you, and you can take it the way you want to take it, I have shown you what is good. And it is, it is to do what? To do justly. Justly. What is justly? That means you don't cut corners. You don't do something that would, would really mar your image of God. Right? Being justly. You're going to do it right even if no one else knows. Okay? And the second part of being good is to love mercy. What does love mercy mean? It means that you're going to give the other person something they don't deserve. That's what mercy is. You're giving someone else something that they didn't earn. I'm watching the clock. Okay? You give them something that they did not earn. And then lastly, in that being good sequel, is you're going to do it humbly. Humbly. You're not going to broadcast in the street, I help X, Y, Z out of trouble and I'm a good fellow or I'm a good girl. You do it very humbly, justly, with mercy and humbly, walking with your God. In summary, always whatever you encounter in your 168 hours every week, you do what? You re begin with God and involve him in your plans. Your plans will suggest that you will identify the needs of those who are around you, not necessarily everything for you. There's about eight billion people in the world today, and your job, and my job, is to find out how you can be of an influence, a positive influence to those eight billion people. And I gotta tell you right now that you will go to your grave before you find a solution, but you should work on that as a goal. And you'll be happier for it. You'll check out the possibilities of how you do it, and you will set goals, smart goals. Every issue in life, every issue in life, 
Every problem that you have in life has an opportunity window, right? You're here now. If, you, if you're a freshman here now, you ought to be leaving here in about four years or thereabout, less than four years, right? You don't want to stay here for 20 years, right? Because your window will close. Your window of opportunity is, is within the four years. So remember that. So you've got to work hard within the window of opportunity. And finally, our goals make us better people. It will enhance and make you a better person. I would like to leave you with a thought that's not biblical, but it's the serenity prayer. In my old age, I've depended on that. It says, God, grant me the serenity Serenity, what does that mean? Don't get too excited when you first hear the bad news, okay? Don't get too excited. Just, you heard the bad news and your reaction to that is, wow, interesting. How can I be of service, right? Don't judge. Don't judge. I saw in the paper, one of your papers uh, here in, uh, in Nairobi, where it was talking about we have a pregnancy issue with young people your ages, right? right? Well, if, you, if, if someone came to you and said, hey, look, uh, 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 Mary Jo is pregnant, you know, and you get all up into the ceiling and, 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 and you just, you, you, you just, into everything. You, oh, that's too bad, it's terrible, whatever it is. That is what this prayer is saying. Don't do that. Because she's got another problem. She's got a nine month problem, plus the fact she's got maybe 18 or 20 year problem. You know, and she doesn't want anybody to be, you know, not serene. So grant me the serenity, okay? to accept the things that I cannot change. Calm about them. Think them through. Okay? And then the second part I like. This is a three-part stool and then I'll be finished. Serenity. And the second part is courage. Do you have the courage to do what is necessary to change the things that you can. Every one of you can make a change, a positive change in something tomorrow. But do you have the courage? Do you have the courage? And lastly, we heard about this with the, with the women today we, this word was really out there. Do we have the wisdom, the maturity to know the difference? May God bless you in everything that you do for the rest of your life and that you will make a positive difference in someone else's life. And I'm telling you, if you do that, you're going to be better off, you're going to have more resources, and you'll be happier. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity.